first thing, of course, that any new Prime Minister will have to deal with is Brexit. So what is your plan? Well, it's, it's very straightforward. We are in the middle of a constitutional crisis and nothing, literally nothing, can be done until we get through Brexit. And the choice we have to make as a Conservative Party is who is the leader, who is the Prime Minister who is most likely to get us a deal that can get through Parliament um, and allow us to do all the other really important things that I want to do as Prime Minister of this country. And uh, my argument is, as someone who has been a negotiator all their life, I set up and ran my own business for 14 years. I've negotiated big deals in government, whether it's the uh, junior doctor's contract dispute, which was a very difficult one, uh, the BBC licence fee, which was a, an incredibly short negotiation. I have that experience. And if we can get a deal, that is the only way we will avoid a general election. And you've just been talking about the, the Peterborough by-election with John Ashworth. Uh, if we repeat going to the country on a national scale, then we will see what happened at Peterborough happening on a national scale, which is the right-wing vote, the centre-right vote split, and Labour coming through the middle. And that would be an absolute catastrophe. So what exactly would you do differently then, other than just negotiating a bit better? What, what, what would you do differently? Because the problems will all be there still, won't they, when it comes to Brexit? Well, some of them will, and some of them will have changed. But we do have to learn from what went wrong before. And one of the reasons that Brussels stopped negotiating with us before was because they didn't think that the British government could deliver the British Parliament. And so I would put in my negotiating team a group of people uh, with the DUP, uh, the ERG, who are the Brexit purists within the Conservative Party, Scottish and Welsh Conservatives. So Ollie Robbins would be out then, would he? Well, it has to be led by politicians because the people on the other side of the table have to know that the people they're talking to can deliver that majority in Parliament. And so anything we propose as a British government has to have that credibility. That's the very first step. So what's the substance that would have changed? You said just before that some things would stay the same and some things would change. What, what would change? Well, I um, had a conversation with Angela Merkel um, earlier this week um, at the D-Day celebrations. And I'm absolutely clear that if we take the right approach to this, uh, the Europeans would be willing to negotiate on the package. So and what I did she say exactly? Well, she said that, you know, of course, with a, a new British Prime Minister, we would want to look at any solutions you have. She said, up to you. She said, she said to me, Germany doesn't have that border with the Republic of Ireland. You do. So you need to come up with a solution. It's okay. absolutely clear that... So what's the your solution? Well, it's clear that the backstop is not acceptable to Parliament. And so it's going to be a solution that's based around technologies, what the Germans call intelligent border. And I think that's doable, but we have to find the structures that reassure people that uh, this is deliverable. And uh, we have to find the mechanisms to deal with a situation where we can't agree on what technology is capable of. But if you're asking me as someone who's, who's done deals all their life, is there a deal here? Yes, there is. And finding that deal, is going to mean approaching the EU uh, with the right kind of person. If we go in with an ultra hard line approach, we will get an ultra hard line response back. And then we'll get to the end of October and nothing will have changed except we'll be one step closer to a general election. So just very clearly, come the 31st of October, our current deadline, if that deal hasn't been done yet, which if you're relying on new technology is, let's be frank, quite likely, are you prepared to delay or leave with no deal? Well, I've always said that if the only way to leave the European Union was without a deal, then I would do that because we have to honour that referendum result. Um, but I would do so with a heavy heart because of the potential risks to business and indeed to the union. And I wouldn't do it if there was a prospect of a good deal. And, you know, a wise prime minister... Would you do to... it instead of delay, though, if those were the options? Well, we don't know what choices we're going to face then. There's a very high probability that Parliament will take no deal off the table, as it did in March. Um, and so we, we don't know who the so new European Commission is going to be. You won't rule out another extension? Well, what a wise Prime Minister will do is take decisions on the basis of the choices that they have in front of them. What an unwise Prime Minister will do in this situation is something that precipitates a general election. Now, if you say the 31st of October is a deadline, come what may, and then Parliament blocks no deal, 
The only way you can deliver that promise is to have an election and change Parliament, and that would be catastrophic for the Conservative Party because, just as in Peterborough, as we were saying, uh, Corbyn would sneak through the middle. And the key thing here is Jeremy Corbyn is never going to deliver Brexit. I mean, you look at the Labour Party today, and it's not going to happen. So if we want Brexit, we've got to be very smart in the way we approach, it, approach this. Listening to what you're saying, you're effectively saying, look, people need to trust you to do a better negotiation, effectively. But I just question, some will wonder why they should trust you on Brexit when you have had a number of different positions. You voted Remain. You now say that you'd vote Leave if there was another referendum. Back in 2016, you floated the idea of a second referendum. Now you say you don't want it. In the aftermath of the referendum, you also talked about keeping the single market on the table. Now you say you don't want to be in the single market. You previously said that we'd survive and prosper without a deal. Now you say it would be political suicide. I mean, how do we know what you actually think on it? Now, my position has been completely consistent. I didn't say no deal would be political suicide. What I said is going into an election would be political suicide. I've always said that we should implement the referendum result, and I've always said that there should be democratic endorsement of the type of Brexit that we do, and that's indeed what happened because we had a general election where more than 80% of the country voted for parties that wanted to leave the single market, and at that stage, the customs union, because that was Labour's policy at that time. The question now is not how you voted in a referendum three years ago, it is who has the skills to, to deliver a deal that is going to get us out of the EU before we have a general election. And I have those skills, and I am passionate about changing this country for the better in all sorts of things. But the one thing I would say is, as an entrepreneur, I want to fire up the economy. I want to help thousands of young people do the things that I did uh, when I was uh, setting out from university. And I'm excited to do that. But those skills are also relevant to the situation we're in now. You need to have a negotiator. This is about the art of tough negotiation not the art of empty rhetoric. Um, you're launching your strategy on that note to try and win over young voters, something the Conservative Party hasn't exactly been doing very well at recently. What, what do you want to do? Well, I'm 52, and um, basically anyone younger than me is more likely to vote Labour than Conservative. And just three years ago, that tipping age was 35. So if that continues as a party, we are just going to die on our feet. And I'm not one of those people who says that we should always accept that young people are going to vote left and then when they get a mortgage and have a family, they'll move to the right. Uh, we, as the party of aspiration, have to have a message for young aspirational people. Now, I joined the Conservative Party when I was 19 years old. And my dreams were to set up my own business, uh, to save up for a family, to buy a house. And those dreams were also... To be Prime Minister? Uh, dream that was mind. kind of the back of them somewhere, but I wanted to do those other things first. Yes. And, um, you know, the truth is that that was also, at that time, it was the late 1980s, that was Conservative government policy to make those dreams happen. If Jeremy Corbyn gets in, it will be Labour government policy to stop those dreams. So as a party of aspiration, we've got a very strong okay. message. I mean, Jeremy uh, Corbyn clearly say that that's not what a Jeremy Corbyn government uh, would do. But, but look at the record of even less left-wing Labour leaders than Jeremy Corbyn. Every single one has left unemployment higher uh, when they left office than when they arrived in office. As compared to a, a Conservative government that's created a thousand jobs for every single day we've been in office. So, so that, that's the opportunities for young people. And if we can so get that across... What was a 19-year-old Jeremy Hunt like? Were you well behaved? Did you get into trouble? Um, look, I think uh, every 19-year-old uh, does things that they wouldn't want their mum and dad to find out about. Go on. They were, I'm sure they won't be listening. Go on. I think my mum could well be listening right now. Um, but, uh, You've but, already you know, listened to doing drugs. Um, well, I, I said I, I drank a cannabis lassie when I was backpacking through India. It's not um, quite whether it's the, uh, really counts as doing drugs, I don't know. But um, look, I had a fantastic time when I was young. Um, I lived life to the full, um, but I also had big dreams. And if we're going to succeed as a country, we've got to be the kind of place that allows young people to fulfill their dreams, to reach for the stars. I had a dream of setting up a business. Um, I didn't have any capital from my family, and I, I got going, uh, got it off the ground with my best friend, and I was very proud to do that. Other people will have different dreams, but the fundamental difference between us and the Labour Party is that we know that if we back young people to make their dreams come true. We all benefit from that. Okay. And that's what I want to talk about today. Now, previously, um, on an issue that I know many people feel very strongly about, abortion, 
uh, you have said that you would like to see the legal time limit from ab for abortion being reduced from 24 weeks to 12 weeks. Is that still your view? Well, these are matters of conscience. Yes, my view hasn't changed on that. I, mean, I respect the fact that other people have very different views, and that's why these matters are always matters for free votes in the House of Commons, and, uh, and when they come up, people vote with their conscience. Can you guarantee that if you're Prime Minister, the time limit for abortion would stay where it is? What I can guarantee is that this will be a matter for the House of Commons, not a matter for government policy. Uh, the Prime Minister uh, will have his view, just like every other one of the 650 MPs, and these will be decided as a matter of conscience, but it won't be a government policy to change the law uh, in that respect. It's not a vote that you would bring? It's, it won't be government policy to have a vote. I, you know, if backbenchers choose to have a vote, then we'd have a free vote and everyone would vote with their conscience. OK. Uh, now, this week, you met Donald Trump six times, quite a lot. Did you take him aside and explain to him that you don't think the NHS should be part of a trade deal? Did that come up in your conversations? Uh, yes, I did have that conversation with him. I, I don't think uh, he's uh, the world's biggest expert on the NHS, but what he is a big expert on is trade deals. And he's very, very keen to uh, do a trade deal with the UK, and he reiterated that. And I just explained to him that you know, the NHS couldn't be part of a trade deal, and I think he understands that. So it was you who made him change his mind? Is that what you're trying to say? Or? I think anyone who claims that they got Donald Trump to change their mind might be um, uh, over-egging it a bit, but I certainly made that point to him, as I, th as I think uh, any of the other candidates in this contest would have if they'd spoken to him. Is he a good president? He is a strong president. Uh, there are things that I fundamentally disagree with him about, Climate change would be one, the Iran nuclear deal would be Did you one. raise these? Absolutely. Um, but there are other things where I think we can learn from him. He has got American growth at about double the levels in the UK. If we had GDP growth of, of 3% for a sustained period of time, we'd have an extra £20 billion to spend on public services. When I was running the NHS, I really knew how much we need to put resources into our vital public services. So there's a, there are things that we can learn from his approach. And, and he's also an effective communicator. You may not agree with everything that he says when he tweets, but he takes a lot of trouble to talk to the American people. And I think in modern politics, we have to learn from that as well. Talking about learning from other people's approach, you picked up the reins at the Foreign Office from Boris Johnson. What, how did he leave it? Do you think he was a good Foreign Secretary? Well, Boris has had a very big impact on Britain's position in the world because he led the Brexit campaign. Positive and, um, well, we are going to make it a terrific success because, um, you know, when we've implemented the referendum result, um, we can do amazing things as a country. Um, but he was quite a Marmite character, of course, and there were people, um, other European foreign ministers, who um, found him difficult to deal with because of his views on Brexit. But uh, you knew what ways to... What kind of things have they said to you about that, then? Well, these are private conversations and well, uh, I don't want to, there, but, but, but what I do when talking to those um, other European governments what I hear the whole time is they want to do a deal with us uh, if we approach this the right way they will talk to us um, because this is a problem for them as well as us and I don't think we should be despondent about the fact that this is a very challenging situation because you know a great country like Britain we have been through far far worse in our history and we can get through this we can make a terrific success of this uh, and I think we will. OK. Uh, and finally, uh, Sky News uh, is going to be, as you know, hosting a debate, a head-to-head -head debate with the final two candidates. If you make it through to the final two, can you commit to taking part in that live debate with Sky News? I would be delighted to do so. I've had the email from your head of news already and, uh, and told him that as well. Do you think you'll get through? I think I've got a very good chance because uh, the fundamental choice we've got is what type of person is going to be able to go to Brussels and get a deal. And when you think about that in that way, and you think about the risks to our country, if we don't get a deal and we end up with a general election, then there's only one answer. Why are you so worried about general election if you're Prime Minister? Wouldn't you win? Because I, I do want, uh, I'd be very happy to fight a general election, um, but I want to fight a general election having delivered what we promised to do last time, which is Brexit. Okay. And I think if we go before then, people will rightly say, why are you asking for another mandate when you, haven't, you guys haven't done what you said you did last time? I think we can deliver it. That's what I want to do. Uh, Foreign Secretary, thank you very much for being on the programme this thank morning. Thank you.